Hello, everyone. Welcome to a brand new offering from the Brown School, our Open Classroom Series. My name is Gary Parker. I'm the Associate Dean for External Affairs and the inaugural director of the Clark Fox Policy Institute at the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. I hope everyone is safe and healthy with so many people at, under stay-at-home orders. We wanted to offer the opportunity to open our virtual doors and share with you some opportunities of professional development or even perhaps learning about something new. So uh, several times a week, we are offering uh, access to some of the Brown School's world-renowned social work, public health, and social policy faculty. Uh, this coming up Thursday, we'll be featuring Professor Angela Hobson, who's the Assistant Dean for the Public Health Program. She'll be talking about food and chemical safety, why and how now more than ever. This will be an incredible, uh, engaging talk, and I hope you're able to join us. And you can register for that event uh, at the Brown School website. Uh, one note, since we have a couple hundred people registered for today's talk, uh, we cannot see or hear you, but we want to hear from you. So uh, if you have a question or you have a thought or a comment, uh, please enter them into the chat box. And my co-hostess, Janet, and I will be uh, monitoring them and sharing them uh, during the Q&A. We will also be posting a recording of this talk onto the Brown School's YouTube page. Uh, so if you have friends that may not have been able to join us today but would like to watch it, it will be uh, there for them to enjoy. And today we have uh, Professor Doug Luke. He is a leading researcher in the areas of public health policy, system science, and tobacco control. Uh, he di he uh, directs work focused primarily on evaluation, dissemination, and implementation of evidence-based public health policies. And in addition to his appointment at the Brown School, he is a member of the Institute for Public Health, the director of the evaluation for the Institute of Clinical and Translational Sciences, and a founding member of the Washington University Network of Dissemination and Implementation Researchers. His talk today, uh, which has created quite a bit of buzz, Sim City and Zombies. What can they tell us about pandemics? Uh, and as a huge fan of George Romeo, who is considered the father of zombies, I was very much looking forward uh, to hearing about uh, uh, Sim City and Zombies. So without further ado, please welcome uh, Professor Doug Luke. Let me just, uh, thanks Gary um, and Janet. Let me um, switch over here. Um, and um, uh, thanks for the introduction. And I've been looking forward to this, uh, particularly, you know, as Janet set this up, this is a way for us to connect with people uh, in ways that actually before the pandemic maybe was a little harder to do. So this is, this is, um, I'm, it's a little harder to see you all out there, but uh, I'm really glad that it's, uh, you know, such, such a large group from around the world is able to connect to the Brown School and Wash U and, and, and see these interesting talks that um, we've been having over the weeks. So um, yes, yeah, so SimCity and Zombies. So I'm going to be talking about really pandemics and modeling. And you'll see the connection to SimCity and Zombies hopefully as we go through this. But um, this is actually um, some thoughts I've had over the months about how our work, particularly how um, public health research can inform all the things that we have to think about and do in terms of COVID-19, but other types of, of pandemics. Um, so uh, good titles are half the battle. I tell some of my doctoral students, so I was thinking what would be an engaging title. Uh, so stay tuned, see, it, see, see what the connection to SimCity and Zombies are. Uh, what? What I'd like to do um, in the next 30 minutes or so is um, give a little background on the epidemiology of pandemics. Uh, we're in the middle one, I, uh, it's sort of obvious. Uh, we're all uh, quarantined in our own houses these days. Uh, so how did this happen? Uh, how do public health professionals, particular, uh, particularly epidemiologists, how do they study pandemics and infectious disease outbreaks? A big tool that they use are things that are called computational modeling. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. 
And um, in, in my talk today, I'm gonna emphasize a couple specific tools, social network analysis and agent-based models. Um, those sound technical, but I think you're gonna see that these are pretty easy to understand tools. And they're really important when we start asking tougher questions about pandemics. Um, and these, um, and, and in particular, what I wanna emphasize are the importance of our understanding of social and physical environments when we study pandemics, um, how to use these tools to study what we call progression dynamics. That's essentially how does a, a pandemic change over time. Uh, you've seen a lot in the news about how we're trying to predict when the curve will flatten, for example. Uh, we use models to try to say when will the curve flatten in the United States and other parts of the world. And, and so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then maybe most importantly, how can we use these tools to understand better how to prevent in the future or how to mitigate, that is reduce um, the, um, um, re reduce the effects of uh, existing pandemics like COVID-19. So those are, those are the goals. I'll come back, this little figure that I have here, I'll explain what this is in just a little bit. Um, essentially, as we do everything at the Brown School is evidence-based and is how do we take science and translate it to affect the world, improve health, and obviously COVID-19 presents an enormous challenge for the entire world, but public health can uh, study it, evaluate it, propose solutions, propose ways that we can, again, mitigate the effects of, of pandemics like COVID-19. So how do we do that? Well, we do this particularly by, by using models. Uh, models, quite simply, allow us to predict the future. They can be used for lots of other reasons, but in pandemics, we want to know what's going to happen next week, next month, next year. There's a lot of talk, for example, about a second wave of the pandemic uh, that might hit in the fall. Uh, how do we know that there's going to be a second wave? Well, it's because of the models that scientists are developing. Now, there's many types of scientific models. Uh, there are statistical models that are very database. There are mathematical models. And the models I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about today are computational models. And I'll hopefully the, the difference will, will become clear as I go through these examples. Now, the first thing when we think about models is understand they are designed to answer a few questions. They're not able to answer all questions or no specific model can answer all questions. And so the success of a model depends partly on the specificity of that model. Uh, what you see here on the right-hand side of the screen is something that was uh, published in the New York Times a few weeks back. And it's a nice comparison of the multiple models that have been produced around the world. Um, uh, and uh, these models were used to forecast, that is predict, uh, daily death rates. Um, uh, and you can see with the colored lines, these models don't agree. They predict different things. Um, this is partly due, it's complicated to build these models. The models are based on the assumptions that go into them. So these different models uh, have different assumptions. And they also depend on the quality of the data. So think about the challenges we've had in doing things uh, like testing for who has been exposed and how hard that's been, let alone perhaps the political context of how those data are being reported. If you don't have good data, these models are not going to be able to do a good job for us. So models are important. The most important model um, in studying infectious diseases, epidemics, and pandemics is something called the SIR model. And any epidemiologist in the audience today totally know this. It's you, you, it's epidemiology 101, but the SIR model is in fact a fairly simple model. And it's called SIR because it has three particularly important numbers that um, go into the model. The first is the number of people who are susceptible to catching um, a virus or a disease. And, and um, at the beginning, it's everybody typically. 
Uh, then there's the number of inf uh, infected. So over time, some of those who are susceptible, susceptible become infected. And then hopefully what we see is people recover over time. The vast majority of people who get infected um, with COVID-19 do recover. Now, knowing these three numbers, you're a, this is the, the basic SIR model is a type of a mathematical model. It's solved using differential equations. But what you get here, this is a characteristic um, infectious disease curve that shows how over time, what you see is um, the susceptible people start high. Over time, infections rise. But then as people recover, the green line, the number infected goes down. And so this, um, this SIR model is hugely important. Um, it's typical in the past and now, the SIR models are particularly useful for predicting the time course of uh, an epidemic. Meaning uh, here you see two, two examples, but the point here is over time, um, you can use the model to predict when essentially will the epidemic die out. Um, and uh, it's been, it's, it's, it's a fundamental epidemiologic model of, of infectious disease. Now, underneath um, this SIR model is a particular number that's important. And uh, some of you may have, th this actually, you know, we're all um, armchair epidemiologists these days, if, uh, um, if you're following the news. Some of you may have seen actual discussion in the general news about the um, R sub zero or the, the reproductive number. And the reproductive number is essentially a number that captures um, the probability of infection. In particular, if one person has um, the virus or is, um, is contagious, how many other people will that one case infect? And um, here I present um, what goes into the R number, the reproductive number. And what's particularly important for us in COVID-19 is D, duration of infectiousness, because it turns out COVID-19 hangs around a long time. We've heard that, you know, 14 day incub incubation period. Well, what that means is you've got a lot of time when you are bumping into other people to infect other people. And so the R number is actually, at least before social distancing was implemented, the R number was pretty high. And um, I'm always amazed at how quickly Wikipedia updates. But here is um, a table of R of reproductive numbers for a wide variety of infectious diseases. And you see in the upper third is COVID-19 with a pretty large um, R value. Now, these numbers will change as we do more research. And these a, a big part of um, intervening with pandemics is driving that R number down. So think about it. If you're staying at home, not interacting with people, that both the number of contacts are going down and the probability of transmission goes down. So actually R itself is going down even though the duration of infectiousness hasn't, hasn't changed. So this number is important. But here's a key. Um, these traditional SIR models ignore social structure. They have an assumption. Remember I talked about assumptions just a little bit ago. Here's a particular assumption. Um, there's a number that's the average number of contacts per person per unit time. That is, the SIR model assumes something that we call random mixing. It just, it, it means in a population, you have a random chance of, of getting the disease. Well, that's not how we catch COVID-19. That's not how we catch infectious diseases. You catch them from the people you work with, the people that you live with, um, the people who you hug and kiss. Um, and, um, and that's not random, it's, it's anti-random. <laughs> that is, these models are powerful, but they ignore social structure. This is important. Um, and so here's, here's why social structure is important. Um, this is a social network diagram of the, of, of the index case, or what we used to call patient zero, um, in the United States of the HIV AIDS um, epidemic in the early 80s. Um, some of you may know the story that um, this person was a flight attendant. 
And um, that was one of the reasons that AIDS spread so quickly in the United States. Um, this is a network diagram that shows sexual contacts between people, and it provides a lot of information. It, 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 you can tell who, who had contact with whom. You can see the geography, so New York, LA, Georgia, Pennsylvania. Uh, there's the color coding is symptom status. And then the, the um, I'm actually not sure what the, um, the oh, the number is, a, is an, a, an order, a time order of when, when symptoms first appeared. Now, this, this network diagram tells a complex story of disease transmission. And uh, in fact, network analysis really, and the, and the AIDS epidemic came together in the 80s. And um, because it turns out that network analysis is important for epidemiologists in two ways. It becomes the core tool that's used for contact tracing, which is how do we, in, er in the early days of an epidemic, how do we track who has it and where did they get it from? Um, but it also gives us understanding of how to intervene, how to, how to it, quarantining is essentially intervening in ways where we can break these contacts or break these potential contacts. Now, for COVID-19, uh, so I'm back to that figure that I showed you early on, I'm going to I'm going to pop out here. So this is this is an actual website. What you're seeing here, it looks like abstract art that you might put up on your wall, but this is a contact tracing social network diagram of the co of the COVID-19 cases in Singapore. Singapore did some of the earliest and best testing and contact tracing in the world. And so they have these detailed records and what what contact tracing is is you have cases who either were exposed and or are symptomatic and where they might have gotten exposed. So what you see here is a diagram that shows the people and where they were. And when you explore this in Singapore, there's a lot of dormitories, apartment buildings. Um, uh, this is a lodge. I think that's a dormitory in Singapore. And and you really see this, the story of disease transmission is not just the people, but where the people are and, and where they were when they come in, in contact with each other. You start seeing more complicated structures. So here's a group of people who were exposed at two different physical places. And so this, this type of information is critical. And then if you really wanna see the scary power of COVID-19, this is one place that has all of these people who were exposed and, uh, in Singapore, and it was a particular dormitory. It must have been a very large dormitory. Um, so we use, so the point of my highlighting this um, is, let me hold on a sec. Is we, we use network methods, network analysis methods, as a way of mapping the social structure that are then that that information is going to then be fed into the sort of models I'm going to talk about next. Now, um, there's a lot here. I'm not going to explain all of this, but um, people have studied this, and I I, I want to just highlight what I have in blue here um, by using a micro simulation approach, a, a type of modeling. We show that for epidemics spreading on realistic contact networks, it is not possible to define a steady exponential growth phase and a basic reproduction number. So just to go back really quickly, this, this reproduction number for COVID-19, these numbers tend to all be based on uh, fairly simple calculations that come out of the type of contact tracing that, that um, um, that public health um, agencies do. The problem is these are also based on this simple SIR model, which the point of this study is as soon as you bring more realistic things into these models. So there are things that are happening in schools. There are things that happen in neighborhoods. There's things that happen in households. There are things that happen in workplaces. 
as soon as you bring this social and physical structure into the equations, you can't come up with a simple reproduction number, which basically says we have to be careful about the SIR model. It's only able to do so much for us. So what can we do to expand or complement the SIR model? Well, um, what we can do are use computational models. For the, and these models are their powerful tools that allow us to explore behavioral dynamics within complex systems. And what I just said, when we want to think about how people behave in houses and at workplaces and at schools, this becomes a complex system. Um, we are no longer thinking that we're catching COVID-19 randomly, but we're going to catch it if we spend too much time in a bar or in a nursing home, for example. Um, so we have to use different kinds of models. An ABM, an agent-based model, is a type of computational model, and it's a bottom-up simulation approach. You're building um, an environment, a city, a country, in the computer, and then you're putting things in that environment, people, you can put other things, you could put animals, you can put companies, you can put hospitals, and then you sort of let it loose and you observe that system in the computer. Now, these types of models are attractive to us because they emphasize heterogeneity. What, what do I mean by that? The SIR model doesn't really allow us to say, okay, how do people with high incomes differ from low incomes in terms of quarantining or where they work? Or uh, how do people who live in certain neighborhoods who have less access to healthcare, are they at greater risk of infection? you can put that heterogeneity in an ABM model where it's much harder to put into an SIR epidemiologic model. You can, I've already suggested this, you, you build both physical and social environments. And the big thing is it allows you to see emergent behavior. You can see things that might surprise you. Things like, you might ask a question, when we quarantine people, is it better to quarantine everybody or just first responders or just the first schools or all schools. That is, and it turns out that when you look at a complex system in play, you can't always predict that answer. You have to do the modeling to see what's going on. Now, I, I suggested this, but essentially models are built of these five things. And our, our friend and colleague, Ross Hammond, who's here at the Brown School, this is a framework that he's developed. Um, agents, these are the things in the model. Uh, in pandemics, these are typically people. They've got characteristics, they have properties, they do things. They might go travel to work or school. They might, um, um, we built models where our agents buy tobacco out in the world. They follow rules. For example, in our tobacco models, they buy cheaper products when they can. Nobody likes to spend too much money on things. The models play out over time. You have to see what happens. And as I already said, the people are working in an environment which is typically some combination of a physical or social environment. All right, here we go. For some of you, this is gonna remind you of something. These agent-based models, um, this is a picture of SimCity. Uh, when I was in high school, a long time ago, one of the first games I, one of the first computer games I played was SimCity. I think the original one. It didn't look like this. This is, this is SimCity, circa 2013. What is SimCity? SimCity is a game where you build a city in the computer. People drive around and walk around, and they do jobs. And then, the game part is, you know, things happen to the city. A volcano erupts, or a hurricane hits, or occasionally Godzilla comes and tears down the buildings. And then you try to rebuild the city, but it's a city in the computer and there's emergent, there's emergent behavior. You build a house somewhere and you didn't expect it and you get a traffic jam because everybody wants to go to that nicer house or that nicer business. Agent-based models are very much like these sim cities where you build a fairly, um, it, well, sometimes they can be simple, sometimes they can be more complex, but you build an environment in the computer and then you follow the agents as they interact with that environment following certain rules. And it turns out you can learn a lot. In public health models, you can intervene. Everybody's driving around SimCity, then a virus hits. 
and suddenly people aren't going, aren't traveling to work anymore. What happens to the city? Well, you can use models like this to study that. Um, so I'm not, um, Josh Epstein is one of the um, early scientists who helped develop agent-based models. And uh, I, I just want to highlight a couple things. Prediction and forecasting are one of the real reasons we like to build these models. Um, and certainly for a pandemic, that's very important. But there's lots of other reasons. And as public health professionals who actually want to end up intervening, some of these other things, like studying, um, under, in particular, what I highlight, uh, what I've got here, illuminating core, oops, sorry, illuminating core dynamics. Um, not only can we see what happens, but we can start understanding what some of the underlying mechanisms might be. So it's not just saying that a certain type of quarantining works better than other types of quarantine uh, strategies, but we can observe it and we can try to, and we can actually see why it might work. Um, so um, I'll, I'll give you a couple examples in just a little bit. Um, I'm not gonna, um, agent-based models have been developed over time and many of you may recognize this. This is The Lion King, a Disney movie. And this is the scene where um, there's a stampede. And you see these wildebeest coming down the cliff. Oops. Um, um, Disney didn't have animators animating every single one of these animals. They actually used a pretty famous agent-based model. It's called um, Reynolds flocking model. This is a picture of a computer simulation where when you think of birds or fish in the sea, schools of fish and the complex patterns of how they swim or how they fly, you would think it would take millions of lines of computer code to accurately display that. Reynolds showed that you can build realistic flocking models using very, three very simple rules. Birds don't want to get too close to their neighbors. They want to sort of fly in the same direction that their neighbors are flying. And they sort of want to stay somewhat clumped together. It turns out that if you do, and this, this is about, you know, depending on the computer language, this is about 10 lines of code. But what you get are dynamic systems that look very lifelike. And that is, that is the reason that social scientists in particular are very excited about these agent-based models, is you can model complex dynamics with a few simple underlying rules. So what does that mean for us in public health? Well, um, in fact, agent-based models in public health started with infectious disease outbreaks. So what we're talking about today, this is actually the earliest use of agent-based models. I've got some examples here. I'm going to show you one in just a sec. Um, and, um, and more recently, we've been using models in other areas of public health, particularly in chronic disease. And we have developed, our group has developed an agent-based model that we call Tobacco Town, which is about ways that we can help communities reduce the bad effects of, of, of having availability of tobacco products in their neighborhoods. But these all started with agent-based models looking at epidemics and pandemics. So this is my second thing I want to pop out for. And um, it turns out that epidemiologists have studied real infectious disease outbreaks, but they've also studied zombies. So here's the second part of of my talk. Um, so this is a map of the United States. Now this may be, um, I'll go back and show you the URL if you want to go here yourself. Um, um, and I know this may be a little hard to see, but this is the obviously a map of the United States. And let's, let's start a zombie infection in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Two reasons for this. Um, one is that's where CDC is, and some people think maybe that's where an outbreak might start, um, is, is from the CDC. 
Uh, also, my son lives in Atlanta. <laughs> And, uh, you know, so he might be one of the first zombie victims if there, in fact, were a zombie apocalypse. Let's, let's have somebody in St. Let's, let's have an infection start in St. Louis. Um, and let's, uh, let's pick uh, uh, somewhere in California. Now, it's a little hard to see, but what's happening is there is a, a, um, a spreading zombie stain over the United States. And... We're tracking this over time, if you see the top of this. So, so we're, we're approaching a few days now, 60 hours. And um, you can actually play around with this model. There's, it's so simple, there's really only two important things here, which is how much time it takes for a zombie to walk a mile. That's one of the advantages of zombies. They don't fly, they don't take mass transit. Um, they just, they just um, um, amble along. Um, and the kill to bite ratio. So that essentially corresponds to the underlying R number that we talked about. How, how, um, uh, how likely is it that you would get infected if you get bitten by a zombie? And you could actually play around with this and see what happens. How much time, for example, does it take for the entire United States to become zombies? Now, this, of course, is a... Um, it's a funny example, but people have published papers on this. The point is, is with simple models, it allows you to focus on behavioral dynamics, which allow you to think about how policies might actually work. What kind of policies would we put in place to maybe slow the zombies down or reduce the infection of zombie bites? And um, so let me just pop back. Um, so what has happened, what, what we figured out how to do is we figured out how to take as a starting point the basic SIR model and embed it within a more complex agent-based model that takes dynamics into account, that takes environments into account, that takes agent rules into account. And this allows us to essentially peer more deeply into the complexities of, of pandemic outbreaks. Now, I've highlighted one thing here in terms of typical uses that is particularly important for, I think, a Brown School audience. Unlike the SIR model, which has um, challenges in dealing with heterogeneity, as I already said, agent-based models that bring environment into play allow us to study disparities, health disparities in in very, very different sorts of ways. In particular, disparities are not a property of a person. Disparities are not a property of a neighborhood. Disparities arise about the interaction of people with their environments, with their institutions, with their neighbors. Um, uh, you know, access to healthcare is a huge health disparity. It's partly about income. It's partly about where people live. It's partly about those redlining sorts of policies where certain groups of people are treated differently by our healthcare institutions. These all can be explored um, with uh, these kinds of computational models. All right, the last sort of piece that I wanna do here is just a few examples. Looks like I got about 10 minutes left. Um, of connecting these pieces. So what do pandemic agent-based models actually look like? So, the big thing is once we, once we move from small infectious disease outbreaks to thinking about global pandemics, we need to look at models that, for example, use in the entire population of a country or maybe even the entire population of the planet. And we, some models have realized what, in terms of global transmission, it's not going to be, do you catch some, uh, um, something from the person you live with? But it's, how do you get into another country? Well, you get into another country by flying or maybe driving. And so many of these um, agent-based models for pandemics or epidemics have transportation modules in them. Um, this is the reason I, why countries were considering things like shutting off international travel as a way of intervening. Unfortunately, most of that happened too late for, for COVID-19. Um, 
one of the most in public health, one of the most famous um, agent based models for epidemics is something called Midas. And, um, and it's been used for lots of um, epidemics, H1N1, for example. Um, and the value of the Midas models have been for testing different mitigation strategies. So, you know, if, if you got, if once you have a vaccine, do you vaccinate everybody? Well, that takes a long time and, um, and it costs a lot, but could, is it better to, or, you know, could you also get away with targeted vaccinations? Well, these are things that are hard to do experiments on. You're not gonna randomize people to do this. So these kinds of models are invaluable. You build the model, you, you um, look at how things are working in a baseline sort of case, and then you say, all right, here is a vaccinate everybody strategy. You run that for a while, and then you say, here's a vaccinate only targeted people. You run it, and then you're able to compare the results of those models. So as an example, this is a global model. And what you can see is it can then be applied to specific localities, in this case, countries. Now, this model that was a mobility model, so it used international travel, was very good at calculating when uh, an epidemic hit a peak, um, its peak time for the United States and Canada, but not so good for the Ukraine or Mongolia or Uzbekistan. That's valuable information. We can look at that and say, well, why is that? Well, these countries are different in these ways and we hadn't included that in the model. So you can, there, there's an incremental model development um, uh, process that happens. Um, this is from a, a talk I gave a few years ago, but this is during the Ebola outbreak. And there's a, an amazing group in, in Germany that does modeling. And they did a model that not only um, was it a, a, a worldwide air transportation model, but you could pick individual airports around the world and see what your risk of getting Ebola was if you flew into that airport during the, and I was giving the talk in Boston. And so I decided to highlight Boston. And fortunately for all the people in Boston, the, the chance of getting Ebola was very, very low. <laughs> I'm just gonna skip that one for now. Um, so, What's particularly important for us in this time of a global pandemic? Well, first of all, people have been studying pandemics for a while using these sorts of models. So we already know things. Sometimes the mainstream media pretends that we actually don't know anything about the current pandemic, but we, we already know a fair amount. So for example, previous studies in looking at school closures have found where they compare different kinds of school closure strategies, they found not only is it important which schools get closed, but closure duration is important. I'll come back to that in just a second. How long you close the schools down is important. Um, it's important to model not just the health outcomes, but economic outcomes. This was a study that said, okay, School closures are effective, but they cost, you know, you, we, we want to understand what it costs society. And this is, some, this is one of those unintended consequences. It turns out you lose a certain number of nurses and physicians and front care healthcare staff, because if you close schools, they have to stay home and take care of their kids. That's, that is something that comes out of these models. Here's something that is very scary for us. Um, so uh, a few years ago, this group studied the entire cost and uh, both health and economic costs of different kinds of um, social distancing strategies. What they found in terms when you combine health, so what you want to do is improve health um, at low cost. That would be the ideal. What they found is the best options are a strong social distancing perspective or no intervention at all, because if you don't do anything, it turns out that things happen relatively fast and the pain uh, doesn't stick around quite as long. What they found is the worst case was something in the middle. Partial or delayed social distancing is worse than doing nothing. I'm, I, I'm, staying, I'm trying to stay very apolitical in this presentation, but what is the United States doing right now? What is Missouri doing right now? Which of these doing nothing a strong cautious control scenario or 
something that maybe gets um, um, stopped too soon. This is really what, what worries me when I look at these studies. And then finally, I was in a talk just yesterday. Um, and as, as many of you know, universities around the world, healthcare companies around the world are studying COVID-19. And WashU and the Brown School is very involved with this. And uh, some of our colleagues, <coughs> Shen Yang Guo and Tim McBride and their group um, um, have early preliminary data that have looked at specific mitigation strategies. And what they found is these three things, closing of non-essential businesses, prohibiting large gatherings, and having limits on bars and restaurants seem to be particularly effective at reducing infection rates. Um, now, this is not a computational model. This is using more traditional statistical modeling. But I wanted to share that our colleagues here are really in the thick of it in terms of advancing the science. Um, for those of you, especially the students in the audience, um, there are tools that are very accessible and available. And NetLogo is uh, an agent-based modeling tool that is free. You can just Google NetLogo and you can download it and play around. And this is actually uh, what NetLogo looks like. And it's a very simple model of disease transmission uh, across a social network. And you can see the people being infected across a, a fairly realistic network. And then you can also track the SIR model underneath it. So again, this is, this is available and, um, um, and free. So I'm at the end and I just wanna say a couple more things and then we'll have time for some questions, I think. So um, for those of you who know a little art, you might recognize this. This is a, this is a, a, a painting by the famous a surreal uh, painter, Rene Magritte. And, um, and some people, I mean, we, I think I knew it as the pipe painting, but it actually has a name called the treachery of imagery. And for those of you who understand French, what this says is this is not a pipe. Well, yeah, it is a pipe. What else could it be? But as part of the surreal art movement, he was trying to make a point that, no, this is not a pipe. This is an image of a pipe. It's a representation of a pipe. In fact, I think what he said is, you can't smoke this pipe, therefore it's not a pipe. <laughs> well, what does that have to do with what, what I've been talking about? Well, I found this just the other day and I loved it. Um, so you should recognize that this is the SIR model we've been talking about, but no, it's not that simple. The, the French says, this is not an epidemic. And this is the same point that Magritte was trying to make. Don't confuse our models with the reality. Models are simplified representations. Um, and the reason that's, and oh, you know, another phrase some of you may have heard is the map is not the territory. And as scientists, we tend to get confused about that. The model tells us things that may help us deal with the real quote epidemic, but the model can only be a simplified version of the epidemic. So in other words, always be careful, be skeptical about the models. And only one more thing to leave you with. Um, I know some of you wanted actually to see more SimCity or more zombies in this talk and other people agree with you. Um, this virus sucks, I wanted zombies. So um, I'll stop there and if, I, I, Gary, why don't you take over? Um, uh, but I'm very, very happy to stick around and we can discuss um, questions if, you, if you've got them. So thank you so much for the, that was informative. And heck, if you didn't do it, but you, you stitched together SimCity zombies and uh, this pandemic that we're living. Lots of nice comments coming in about the value of this information uh, through the chat and some questions from folks that are wishing for a deeper dive and discussion of things that you that you had a chance to speak to just briefly. So Lacey was wondering about the role of public health experts um, on influencing the, the balance between health precautions and opening the economy 
Um, and basically, what do models say about the business and the health impacts of what we're living? Well, um, so I think, um, I think models help a lot. And in particular, um, if any of you, and this is true of universities, this is true of hospital systems, this is true of healthcare clinics, we have to make decisions about things that are gonna happen in the future. We have to make decisions now about things that may or may not happen in the future with um, limited data. Um, I forgot a metaphor that I was gonna say when I talked about we use models to predict the future. So imagine a crystal ball. We've all seen this in, in, in movies and in, in um, um, Lord of the Rings and so on. And you use the crystal ball to peer into the future. But imagine that the crystal ball is dirty and cracked and you can't really see things that clearly. Well, <laughs> that's what our models do. They tell us something about the future, but it's always open to interpretation. And so the main thing is they, they give you a way to interpret the data that we have to inform decision-making. Um, it's very stressful. Anybody who's been in a decision-making um, uh, situation with the, the COVID-19, you never feel like you know exactly what you need to know. But this is the best thing we've got. We take raw data, we put it into models, and it says, in particular, one of the things these models do is not just how many people may, let's say, die, but confidence ranges. So they tell us if things go as good as they could go, this is the lowest number of people. Um, if things really go off the rails, this is the highest number of people. And it's sometimes those ranges of confidence that are more important for us than that actual point prediction. So I don't know if that exactly addresses it, um, but, um, um, and then, you know, healthcare workers on the front lines, um, I, I just think there's a lot of, I mean, there's so much pressure on the frontline health workers, and it's really a shame that we cannot communicate clearly enough what we know that it gets, it gets, um, it's a complicated information environment out there, and there are people who are actively denying or, or muddying the waters in terms of what we know about um, these epidemics, and that's a real shame. I'll jump in with the next question because it appears that Janet's dogs are protecting her from the zombie apocalypse. Uh, Charles has a question. He says, what are the effects of a national strategy versus a state-by-state -state strategy on the models? Let me just, let me just speak um, um, in general about that because um, I don't know that for COVID-19 we know exactly, but um, this is, uh, here's the thing, um, for a, a truly global pandemic like COVID-19, uh, smaller political units, meaning things like states or counties, um, they're where policies have to be implemented, but viruses do not stop at the borders. And so it's one thing for the federal government to give a lot of authority for local decision making, which is in general a good thing. But when you have a situation where states end up getting pitted against each other, either, either fighting for resources that they need, or one state has a very cautious um, social distancing policy in place, and the next state has a very lax one, um, that's a real problem because if, 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 if there is an outbreak again that happens in the lax state, the, the, the other state that did all the right things, that's not going to protect them that they did all the right things if they're neighboring state and there's a lot of cross traffic. Now, you know, in the middle of social distancing, which our country has responded to pretty well, uh, that would be fine. But I think the, op well, this is my own opinion now, I'm being careful. I think the opening up that's happening is a much more dangerous phase than the initial clampdown is because of those differences. But that's my own opinion. Okay, so hopefully the, the zombies have either gotten my dogs or my dogs take them away. Um, Mary is asking about research that she saw that suggested 
that the epidemic in the U.S. most likely originated in New York. Um, she's wondering if you're familiar with the research she's referencing, and she's curious about what models or techniques was behind that. So, um, yes, and in particular, there was a, um, some of you may have seen this, there was a great infographic that basically showed for the United States, it looks like our curve has flattened, except when you take out New York, where New York has flattened, and then suddenly the rest of the United States is still on this upward curve. And, um, and I think it's a great infographic because it shows the time dynamics that are important. The, the, the disease, whether it started, I, 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 there's also some suggestion that it started on the West Coast, but whether it start, wherever it started, New York was the earliest place that it exploded. And, and because so many people travel to and from New York, it was the first super spreader. In fact, it started in Seattle. It, there was an outbreak in, in, in Washington state, especially in some nursing homes, but that didn't, the, the tracing now shows that that didn't affect the rest of the United States as much until it hit New York. And this is one of the reasons it's hard to think about an epidemic. The reason that New York has turned the curve is because it started earlier. So we're catching up. So we will definitely, the curve will flatten for us. All, at the, all epidemics flatten out. But it's, it's a useful reminder that, that New York wasn't doing something necessarily differently from what Missouri was doing. They're just doing it earlier. And, and um, so, um, so I don't know if that's exactly Mary's question, but that's, that, that is that, um, um, let me just add one other thing. In terms of these models, people have shown that just a few days difference, starting the social distancing just four days sooner, saves thousands of lives. And I may, I may be even off by an order of magnitude, but the point is, is you think, all right, you know, we were going to do it Monday, but let's just hold off until Friday. Well, that's a decision there's a, there's a, you know, there's an exponential effect of that decision. And so again, it, that temporal course that, that epidemics have is, is really, really important for us to understand. We had a number of folks who are asking, you know, that, that there are a lot of models out there that some are predicting that a second bigger wave is on the way, that multiple smaller waves are on the way. Do, do you have any thoughts or any of the research that you've seen on what we could possibly expect? Um, <laughs> well, um, you know, we all are, we all are used to the flu and we talk about the flu season and, um, you know, we don't even think about it much except some people in our families are the ones who always, um, urge us to get our annual flu shot. That's my wife. Um, um, and, um, and we don't think about it much because even though the flu still kills a lot of people around the world and, and nationally, it's predictable. It, it, uh, we sort of know what we can do to prevent it as much as we can. Um, COVID-19, of course, is new. We don't have a vaccination yet. Apparently, the research shows that it's likely to sort of hang out there. Um, it's going to be out in the world. And um, because of complex dynamics with temperature and climate and 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 other things, people do believe, and, and oh, and other coronaviruses. So, you know, COVID-19 is a type of a coronavirus, and we've had many coronaviruses in the past. So, there, the scientists are, um, um, are expecting that there will be another uptick. Now, um, getting it under control means moving towards herd immunity, getting a vaccine out there, doing the sorts of treatment, testing treatment and prevention measures that eventually it will join the other coronaviruses where we feel we have a handle on it. But whether there is a big outbreak in the fall or whether it sort of simmers along, you know, because some people are, aren't saying it's too, it's not too, it's just going to be continuous for a while. I don't know enough about that work to really say anything more than that, except that um, I think most of us are understanding that our world has changed now and it's not going to go back to normal, um, you know, in a couple weeks. And we have, to, and I would just say, and of course, we have to come up with some balance because the world, you know, our society cannot, I mean, this sounds apocalyptic, but, you know, I've got zombies in the talk. 
um, our societies can't survive under this sort of lockdown for years. That's that's not that's 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 not feasible. So we're going to have to figure out what the right balance is. So time for just one last question. And you had mentioned um, that modeling allows us to explore disparities. I'm curious if you have seen models that would talk about how to um, remedy those um, disparities, what, what interventions might be possible? Um, let me say, so, so I've never done an infectious disease model myself. Um, so let me use the example from my own work, which is chronic disease. Um, um, and um, we've developed, th from our models, we're developing tools for stakeholders to use where they can, in their own communities, Atlanta, Boston, St. Louis, um, look at what their maps look like if they were to implement policies like removing tobacco retailers that are close to schools or only allowing tobacco products to be um, um, sold in pure tobacco stores, you know, not in gas stations, for example. And what we're able to do is create maps, interactive maps, this is online, um, that, for example, a mayor or a, a public health director, a city public health director, can look and see what their city and community looks like when they implement these different policies. And as part of these maps, we actually can show what we call the disparities reduction potential of these policies. So what we can see is, for example, the current situation, often you have more tobacco retailers in poorer neighborhoods. And what we're able to show is certain types of policies even out the playing field more than other policies. That is, um, some policies, if you implement them in certain cities, and each city is different, by the way, but in certain cities, certain sets of policies appear to have the potential, you know, I'm using careful language here, but they appear to have the potential to even the playing field where you both richer and poorer neighborhoods would have the same exposure to tobacco products. Whereas the current, the current situation is there's huge disparities on exposure to tobacco products. So that's one example. Other um, there's other work, there's some work on domestic or, uh, 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 violence and uh, violence protection. And, and if you intervene in communities by increasing policing or doing more neighborhood watch types of things, you can explore which one reduces the disparities around community violence. So yes, those are, there are good examples of that. Great. Um, Doug, thank you so much. Um, and before we wrap up, are there any final thoughts that you want to leave people with? Say that again. Just asking if you want to make any closing comments. We're nearly to time. I just, I think um, it's, a, so I think this, I guess what I would say is this is, I, I really appreciated being able to do the talk. It's nice to talk about something to a broad audience about how important that the work that we're doing at the Brown School is. Um, you know, sometimes there's a sense that Wash U is an ivory tower or the Brown School is an ivory tower, but I think the thing that defines the Brown School is impact, social justice impact. That is, we do work that matters, and it matters if we are able to do work that helps real communities um, improve real health. And that's what I've been most excited about in my own career is, is um, science is fun and challenging, but science that gets translated into policy, into community action, that is, that's the real thrill. So thanks for the opportunity. And I would just say to everybody out there, stay, stay connected and stay healthy. Well, actually, stay connected, but socially distanced. <laughs> There you have it. Well, Doug, thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you for doing work that matters and sharing this information uh, with our community. I appreciate it very much and, and appreciate the audience being with us. Also appreciate my handsome co-host, Gary Parker. Thank you for continuing to make Open Classroom a success as our audience does. Um, just want to close out by reminding everybody that we're back on Thursday with Dr. Angela Hobson's talk on food and chemical safety. Uh, so if you haven't signed up yet, please, please do. We'd love to see you back. 
Um, and with that, we'll send everybody off. Uh, have a wonderful week and stay healthy and safe out there. Bye, everybody. Thanks again, Doug. Yep. See you all later. Okay.